Hi, this is a PowerPoint video about real estate. Real estate is uh, a bunch of things. Uh, a house is a place to live. It's a good investment. And you also need to know about real estate because you might need to buy real estate for your company. A uh, doctor's office, for example, might need to get a, a building uh, for your store or for a restaurant. So uh, many careers will be helped if you know a little bit about real estate. You also might want to work in the real estate industry. Of course, you need a place to live. What about real estate as an investment? How does buying a house compare to buying stocks and or bonds? And if you look at the dark line here, you can see stocks. And then this gray line is the bonds. And the dotted line is inflation. So which asset class grows the most? Stocks, bonds, or inflation? And over here, we have stocks in red. And here you have housing prices in blue. And so you'll see here that housing increases in value. It appreciates in value almost as well as stocks do. And housing prices usually rise, and they usually beat bonds. Okay, so uh, housing, uh, it's, it's good to invest in houses. What has been the historical trend in house prices? Do house prices always appreciate in value? Well, let's go back here to the 1890s. All right, here's World War I. Here's the Great Depression. Okay, and then World War II and we get the post-war boom. But have housing prices always appreciated in value? And here you see what happens after 2007, 2008. This is the subprime mortgage crisis when a lot of banks loaned to people to buy their second or third house, and those people couldn't afford to pay the banks back. So demand for housing dropped. The long-term trend is where? But housing prices do go up or down, up and down. Investing in real estate for the most part is smart. Real estate usually goes up or down in value. It's also an asset you can use, you can live in. Obviously, you can't live in a stock, you can't live in a bond, you can live in a house. Also, the mortgage interest is tax deductible. Please understand what a mortgage is. It's the loan you get from the bank to buy the house. You got to pay that loan back plus interest, and the interest is tax deductible. In other words, you can use it to lower your taxes. Investing in real estate also protects you against inflation. Let's remember what inflation is. Inflation is when you have rising prices. So inflation makes the value of money go up or down. And so real estate that is owning a building or owning land is going to hold its value better than cash does. When inflation makes cash lose value, uh, real estate holds its value. It doesn't decline as much as cash does. Also, investing in real estate is another way to diversify. So you should invest some money in stocks, some money in bonds, and some money in real estate. And remember, Exercise is the best investment. But it can be hard to get enough money to buy a house. The average U.S. salary is about sixty to $70,000. Well, how much, do you need to, how much do you need to make to buy a home in your city? So here's Boston, one of the most expensive housing markets in the country, and you need about $80,000. Again, average US salary, 60 to $70,000. So you need an above average salary to be able to afford a home in the Boston area. If you look at New York City, it's also very expensive. San Francisco, very expensive. LA and San Diego, very expensive. But other places, for example, St. Louis, Chicago, Denver, Atlanta, much, much cheaper. So there's a common saying in real estate, all real estate is local. What does that mean, all real estate is local? Is the real estate market the same everywhere? 
Are are house prices the same everywhere? All right, very important. The rule of two and a half, the rule of 2.5, it says that you can basically afford a house two and a half times your annual salary. So how much do you need to earn roughly to afford a Boston house of $350,000? What income would you need? And you got to multiply it by two and a half to get about $350,000. Now, what if you're married? So what if you and your spouse are putting two incomes together? Then do you need as high of an income or can you two put your uh, lower incomes together and have enough? Again, if you look at the major if you look at the map, it'll show you the major housing markets in the country and the red here means it's more expensive. So, where does Boston rank and New York and New England here? Are these cheap places to live or expensive places to live? And compared to the country, Boston, New York, DC, San Francisco, LA, cheap places to live or the most expensive places? So how can you get enough money to buy a house? What can you do with college? What sort of majors should you think about in college? Credit cards. What should you do with your credit card bill to make sure you have a good credit score, credit rating? What kind of a job do you need to get? And also, what about investment properties? Let's talk about some investment properties, in particular, New England's famous triple deckers. They're called triple deckers because they're three stories, and each one is basically an apartment unit. You see a lot of these in Dorchester and Roslindale and West Roxbury. You could live on one floor, and then what could you do with the other floors to bring in some money in addition to your salary from your job, and then you can slowly save and you'll have enough money eventually to buy a house. Once you have enough cash for a down payment, a down payment's usually about 20% of the purchase price. It's about a fifth, okay? So if we go here to Boston and we see the red, Boston uh, average house would be about $350,000, call it 35. What's a fifth of 35? Okay, so you're gonna need about $70,000 for a down payment. That's 20% of the purchase price. Now, what determines the right home? The three most important considerations of the wise home investor is location, location, location. That's what matters in real estate. That's the first commandment of real estate. Look at the location, look at the location, look at the location. Most people would say that a good location for an apartment or a house or a condo that you own is in a good public school district, on a quiet, safe street, in a neighborhood that's clean and green. It's got parks and trees and that kind of thing. And it's near public transportation so people can get downtown or get to where they need to be. The next thing you need is a mortgage or a home loan from the bank because you have to pay for the rest of the house, right? You're going to put 20% down as a cash down payment, and then you get a mortgage or bank loan for the rest. There are two types of mortgages. One is called a fixed rate mortgage, and the interest rate does not change. It's fixed. For example, you could have a 30-year uh, mortgage at 4% interest. And that 4% interest rate does not change. The other kind of mortgage is called an adjustable rate mortgage or an ARM, an adjustable rate mortgage. In an adjustable rate mortgage, the interest rate is going to adjust. It's going to move depending on the market interest rates. So if interest rates elsewhere go down, your ARM will drop and you'll pay lower interest. That's good for you. And if interest rates go up, 
your interest rate on your mortgage will go up and then you have to pay higher interest and that's bad. So let's look at this. This is uh, interest rates from 1999 up until 2018. You see the general trend is that interest rates have gone down. If interest rates go up, which is better to be in a fixed rate mortgage or an adjustable rate mortgage? And why? If interest rates go down, which is it better to be in, a fixed rate mortgage or an adjustable rate mortgage? And why? So this is a big, big question when you buy a house. Do we want a fixed rate mortgage or an adjustable rate mortgage? And your answer will depend on, do we think interest rates are going up or do we think they're going down? Just to give you a little historical perspective, you can go back here to the 1930s and the Great Depression. People were struggling, so the banks lowered interest rates. That makes it cheap and easy to get a loan and buy a house. Here we have World War II here in the 1940s. And then interest rates got really, really high, basically to stop inflation in the 1970s. And since then, interest rates have gone down. And now they're really pretty low. So it's cheap and easy to get a home loan. Does that make it cheaper and easier to get a house? Again, this is from basically 1980 to 2012. What has happened to mortgage, mortgage interest rates? Have they gone up or down? Does that make it easier or harder to get a mortgage and buy a house? Now, when you go to the bank and get a, a mortgage, a home loan, they're going to look at your credit score, your credit rating, your credit history. And someone with a good credit score is going to get a higher or lower interest rate on their mortgage. So let's look here, okay? Uh, uh, the closer you are to 800 and 850, the higher, the better your credit score. So if your credit score is about 620, that's not very good. You're a little risky. So the bank's going to charge you about 6.2% interest, and you end up paying $300,000 in interest. If you've been good about paying your credit card bills and all your bills on time, you have a higher credit score of about 700, and the bank's going to charge you a lower interest rate because you seem pretty reliable. Then you pay $220,000 in interest over the course of say a 30 year mortgage. If you have a credit score of 780, that's really pretty good. You're very reliable. The bank's gonna charge you a lower interest rate. So you want to pay your bills on time to get a good credit score and then the bank will lend to you at a low interest rate. Here, what is the difference between Shady Sam with a high interest rate and Reliable Robert with the low interest rate, what is the difference in the interest that they're going to have to pay the bank? All right, you're going to make your mortgage payment to the bank every month. At first, most of your payments are for interest, and later on, most of the payments pay back the principal that the bank loaned to you. As you pay off more of the mortgage each month, What's going to happen to your debt here each month? You, you pay your mortgage. Most people have it on direct uh, automatic payment. Electronically, it goes to the bank. So what happens to your debt? You owe less money to the bank. And then your equity, that is your ownership of the house, goes where? It goes up over the course of this 30-year mortgage. So at the beginning of the mortgage, at the beginning of the home loan, who owns most of the bank, most of the house? You or the bank? Who paid for 20% of the house? Who paid for 80% of the house? So again, at the beginning of that mortgage loan, who owns most of the house where you're sleeping? And in year 30, who is going to own most of the house where you're sleeping? 
All right, once you have your financing and your bank loan arranged, you're ready for the next step in the home buying process. You got to find a house, and we talked about that. You want to look for a good location, location, location. You make an offer to the seller, and then the seller accepts your offer. Then you have the inspection. And if you're buying the house, you're going to hire an inspector to inspect the home for problems, maybe for termites or mold or mildew or leaks, any problems. Then the inspector is going to give you a report and you need to read that report carefully so you know if there are any problems. Once you've read the report and you're okay with buying the house, you and the seller agree to the purchase and sale. It's called the PNS. That's when the buyer and the seller agree on a price. Sometimes cash is put in an escrow account. An escrow account is a neutral bank account where money is put into until the deal is done. For example, you might agree to the purchase and sale and say, okay, I'll buy the house for $900,000. That's the average Needham house, house price now, $900,000. Uh, but seller, you first need to take care of the mold and the mildew in the basement. And you're going to put money in an escrow account once the seller has taken care of the mold and the mildew and you've agreed everything's okay, then you release the cash from the escrow account. Another example of an escrow account is if you have a professional athlete who's going to play for the Red Sox or the Patriots or the Yankees or whoever, you say, okay, athlete, we'll pay you a million dollars, but we're going to put the money in an escrow account and once you pass your physical and you're in good shape and you're signed and you're ready to play, then we'll release the money out of the escrow account. The last step in the house purchase process is the closing. That is when the last money is paid, the seller gives the buyer the keys to the house and the deed that is the title of ownership and the, the buyer gives the last bit of money to the seller and you've closed and you now own the house. Okay, so you make an offer, the offer is inspected, inspection, you have the PNS, and then the closing. I'm going to skip these next two slides. Okay, so we've talked about real estate from a residential standpoint as a place for you to live. Let's talk about real estate from a business standpoint, and you might want to go into the real estate business. For example, Maybe you want to be a developer, and I've got some friends who are developers, and uh, that's where I got all this information. So Tim Walsh, college friend, that's Tim over here. Sam Zabala, high school friend. Here's Mukong, high school friend. Michael Yanoff is a Westwood friend. John Salvatore, Maria Salvatore, and Jeff O'Neill here are Westwood friends. So these guys are in the real estate business, and they have given me this information. So this doesn't come out of a textbook. It comes straight from the real estate industry. All right, maybe you want to be a developer. What do they do? They buy land. They're going to bulldoze it, bulldoze the trees or build, bulldoze the old buildings, knock them down, and they're going to build. And they're going to do that as long as interest rates are high or low. The developer might go get a bank loan and buy 10 acres, knock down some old buildings or knock down some trees. Does the developer want interest rates to be high or low? Developers also have to get the necessary permits to have this construction site, to knock down the old buildings, to knock down the trees and that kind of thing. You got to go to the local town government and get the permits. It's a pain in the butt. All right, now, you could also own a local strip mall, all right, like in the center of town. How do these stores benefit from being together? How do the customers benefit from the stores being together? If you were a store, who would you like to be next to? What kind of business? If you were a customer, which stores would you like to have clustered together? 
So now you sort of understand why the center of town is organized the way it is. What businesses do you find there? If you owned a strip mall, which stores would you like to lease to? In other words, which stores would you like to lend to? Would you like to have Shady Sam as a, as a tenant, as a renter? Or would you like to have CVS, Starbucks, and a U.S. post office and a bank? So as a landlord who owns a strip mall, you want to have good, reliable tenants. Here's a local strip mall. If you were an investor and you wanted to buy this mall and you wanted to increase its value by adding better tenants, getting better renters, what kind of businesses would you add? Maybe you want to get rid of this dollar store, this discount store. What kind of tenants or businesses would you want to bring in here to give you more rent? Here's another one. If you're an investor and you wanted to buy this strip mall, maybe for five million bucks, and you wanted to increase its value, uh, what kind of tenants, what kind of businesses would you like to bring in here and uh, lease to? Now, let's take a step up and let's look at uh, not local shopping, not local strip malls. Let's look at uh, big shopping malls. The Nata Collection and Legacy Place and Patriot Place are what we call destination malls that people will drive to. And even these days, mall is kind of an old-fashioned, unpopular word. So now we use terms like the Nata Collection or Legacy Place, Patriot Place. Mall is kind of old-fashioned. Some of these places are what we now call lifestyle centers. They offer shopping. And what else does Legacy Place offer? And who are the anchors? The anchors in a mall are your main attractions. So when you think about Legacy Place, what are the anchors? What are the main attractions? And here in the Natick Collection, who are the anchors? Who are the main reasons why you're driving there? So here's Legacy Place in Dedham. We have our anchors here, this business, and Whole Foods over here. And the small stores in between are called inline stores. Why would you want to be an inline store? What's the benefit of being between two big anchors? Think about what they're going to bring in, who they're going to attract. Think about what's going to happen on the sidewalk here. Why would you benefit? How could you benefit from being an inline store? Here's an aerial or bird's eye view of Legacy Place. Where are the anchors? Well, here's King's Bowling, and here's the movie theater. Here's Whole Foods, here's L.L. Bean, and here's the Apple Store. So you notice that the anchors, are, are they all in one place, or are they spread out? Why? And then look at all the inline stores, these small businesses in between. Now, if you were the landlord for Legacy Place and you wanted to get really cool anchors to get people to come to your mall, if you wanted to get or attract an Apple store, do you think the landlord would charge Apple a high rent or a low rent? Why? What's the incentive? What is the landlord trying to get Apple to do? So you're going to offer Apple and these anchors low rents to attract them. And then you're going to charge the inline stores high rents because they're benefiting a lot from being in between the anchors and they don't have as much leverage or power. So you can charge the smaller stores uh, high rent. Here's the Natick Collection. All right. Here's a bird's eye view. And you see at the end of the mall, spread out, they have the anchors, Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom's, the nice, high-end, expensive stores are together. And here, the more affordable, JCPenney, Macy's, Lord & Taylor, they're together. And again, they're spread out. And in between them, you have the inline stores that you charge a lot of money. 
Patriot Place. How does it work? Robert Kraft bought the Patriots and spent hundreds of millions of dollars buying the Patriots. But the Patriots only have eight home games a year, and a football game lasts about three hours. Eight games times three hours, eight times three is 24. So Robert Kraft spent hundreds of millions of dollars. He owned all this land. You think he wants to use it for just 24 hours a year? Of course not. He wants to use the facility for more than just 24 hours. So now that he owns the land and the stadium, what else could he do to get money out of this asset, out of this property? Why do you think he bought the Revs? Why do you think he hosts concerts? And again, he's got the land. He's got the parking lot. How do you get people here every day? You offer stores. And why do you have a hotel? Because then are people going to be there just for uh, lunch and dinner? If you have a hotel, people are going to be here also for what time of day and eating what meal. So if you look here, has the owner, Robert Kraft, diversified his investment in this land? Or did he just put all of his money into the Pats? Did he just invest in a mall with stores? How is Patriot Place diversified? And why is Patriot Place diversified? So there's several ways to profit from real estate. You can buy a house to live in. That's what we call your primary residence. You could buy a triple decker and rent it out. That's an investment property. You could buy land and develop it. You could also do what is called property management, where the landlord hires you to manage the property. So you've got to find the tenants, that is find the renters. You're going to lease to them. You're going to rent to them and collect rent. You also have to plow the snow in the winter. And if the air conditioning breaks or the heating breaks, you've got to deal with that. That's what property managers do. Some companies do all of it. Some companies will build, they'll develop, they'll own it, and they'll do property management. Some companies do all of those things. Some companies specialize. Another way to make money in real estate is to invest in a REIT. What is a REIT? It's a real estate investment trust. It's basically a company that owns, operates, or finances real estate. Investing in a REIT is kind of like buying into a real estate mutual fund. Owning part of the REIT means that you're invested in some apartment complexes, some hospitals, you own a little bit of some office buildings, some timberland, some warehouses, some hotels, some shopping malls, and again, your money is spread out. One famous REIT is Simon. He used to be run by this guy, Eddie DeBartolo. He owned the San Francisco 49ers football team back when they had Joe Montana and they were winning all these Super Bowls in the 1980s. I know it's hard to see this, but these are all the properties that Simon owns in Virginia, Massachusetts, Florida, Texas, Missouri, etc. Here is the occupancy rate. 87%, 96%. That's the percent of their spaces that they've rented out. And here you see the retail anchors. I know it's a little bit hard to read. So at this mall, they've rented out to JCPenney and Sears. At this mall, it's Bloomingdale's, AMC Theaters. At this mall, it's Nordstrom's. So those big department stores pay rent to uh, Simon, okay? And Simon makes a lot of money, and you can invest in that. Why should you invest in these REITs? It's basically a real estate mutual fund. Well, they're not quite as risky as, uh, they, they kind of fit in here, okay? Uh, so um, let, me, let me show you this, okay? So you know that stocks are pretty risky. They offer higher return. Stocks grow fast, but the company could go bankrupt. The stock could go down, so there's higher risk. 
High return with stocks, high risk. Fixed interest or bonds are a little bit safer. They only grow at about 4%. They're a little lower risk. Real estate kind of behaves in between stocks and bonds. All right, it returns a little bit better than bonds. It's a little bit safer than stocks. This is kind of where real estate fits in. All right, let's look at these different asset classes and how have they performed over the years. So here you see your REITs, your real estate mutual funds. And in 2000, 2001, they were the highest performing asset class. They beat high yield bonds, they beat cash, they beat small cap stocks, large cap stocks, they beat international stocks and emerging markets. Those are the uh, uh, poor countries of the world. Okay, so if you look over the years here, REITs, there, there's some years where REITs do really well. Again, here's the subprime mortgage crisis, 2007, 2008, when the banks lent to Shady Sam to buy a second or third house. He couldn't afford it. He didn't pay back. The banks lost money and real estate took a beating. Okay, look at these horrible, dropped about 40%. So again, you want to invest some of your money in REITs because sometimes real estate does really well. Also, if you look at this chart, can you predict the future? Can you predict which asset class will do well in the future? Is there a clear pattern to this chart? No. So you should spread your money out, some in large cap stocks, orange, some in small cap stocks, blue, some in international stocks, gray, some in bonds. Okay. You see that here, high grade bonds in green and some in real estate. Spread your money out. This is the same sort of graph. I know it's a little bit out of focus, same sort of chart, but it shows you the same deal. All right. Some years real estate performs great, some years real estate performs poorly. Again, you cannot predict the future. Do not try to spread your money out. Another reason to invest in real estate is it is a good hedge. It's a good protection against inflation. Please remember inflation is when prices go up or down. So do you wanna hold cash when there's a lot of inflation? Yes or no? Real estate holds its value better than cash does when there's high inflation. Let's go to the 1970s. There was really high inflation. Look at the consumer price index, really high inflation. So if you look at the Dow Jones, that is, you look at the stock market, the stock market had a really tough time in the 70s. It was going down. Look at home prices. Home prices were going up because, again, real estate, land, a building holds its value when inflation and rising prices are eating away and eroding the value of cash. Here it is again. If you look at equities, that is stocks up here, that's the fastest growing asset. Real estate comes in second. So you want to have some of your money in real estate. Here's some famous local property companies. You've probably seen their signs around on buildings or in construction sites. Suffolk is uh, the largest developer in New England. Okay, they'll clear the land and they'll build uh, big office buildings and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, CBRE, CB Richard Ellis is a property manager. So again, they'll take care of it. If the heat breaks, if the air conditioning breaks, they'll plow the snow. They will also rent out the a property for you. If you have an apartment building, they'll find renters for you. Okay, so they do property management. All right, let's get into real estate finance a little bit. How do you know which property to buy? Again, you've got to follow the first commandment of real estate. Look at location, location, location. The second thing you need to do is you need to use the IRV formula 
to determine the capitalization rate. It's called the cap rate. Let me explain. Uh, I in IRV stands for income, V stands for value, and R stands for rate. So let's break this down. It's going to become clear. What is the income that you could get from owning this triple decker? It's called in accounting the net operating income, the NOI, NOI. So you've got your rental income from the three renters, one in each floor. It's a multifamily house. You got your rental income. You got to subtract out of that the property taxes you have to pay. You have to pay insurance in case the building burns down. And you have to subtract out any money if you have vacancies and you're left with your income, okay? The rental money that you're getting out of the, owning this property. What is the V? It's the value. It's the current market price of the property. So the cap rate, R, is the income divided by the value. In other words, the cap rate is the net operating income divided by the price. So let me give you an example. The cap rate is the income. Let's say you're getting $100,000 a year out of renting these three floors. You get $100,000 a year. That's your income. You're going to divide that by the value of the building. It cost you a million dollars to buy this, and it generates $100,000 a year in rent. So you put $100,000 in the numerator up top, you divide it by a million dollars in the denominator down below, and 100,000 over a million is 10%. In other words, the cap rate is 10%. The capitalization rate is 10%. So each year, you get back 10% of what you paid for the property. Again, you paid a million dollars for the building. Each year, you get back $100,000 in rent. So how many years will it take for you to make your money back? If you spent a million bucks and you're bringing in a hundred thousand rent each year, how many years will it take for you to make your money back? So do you want a high cap rate or a low cap rate? So here's the famous formula, the IRV formula, IRV formula. Okay. The cap rate is equal to the income divided by the value. Okay, the rental income divided by the price. And you guys know you can use simple algebra to manipulate it. And the income is the rate times the value. And the value is the income divided by the rate. So I hope this is clear. Again, this information comes straight from people who are in the actual industry. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.